broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Active Shooters and Armed Assailants, Response Tools for Workplace Violence Events, presented by our sponsor, Heffernan. We're so happy you can join us. My name is Deb Beto, and I will be your moderator today and be monitoring questions you may have during the session. Before we open up the session, let's review a couple of key items. All of the webinar materials we discussed today can be found at the URL currently showing on your screen. I will be sharing this URL in a follow-up email, so don't feel like you need to write it down right now. If you have trouble with your internet connection during the webinar, we recommend leaving the presentation and logging back in. If you have audio difficulties or a telephone line goes dead during the call, hang up and call back again to the same number. If all lines go dead, watch the on-screen chat box for an alternative call-in number. Please feel free to ask questions or provide feedback by using the chat box or questions box during the webinar. If you are using a tablet, you may need to tap on the screen for the options bar to appear, and then you can select the appropriate option. We may not respond immediately, but we will work your questions or feedback into the end of the presentation. If we can't get to your comment or question during the session, we will be online afterwards to respond, or we may follow up in an email if we, we run completely out of time. You may also email us at moderator at aspenrmg.com for up to 48 hours after the webinar. This will be a one hour presentation. Questions and comments are very much encouraged throughout and the presenter will be answering questions at the end. And lastly, we have a number of webinars upcoming covering a variety of topics, including those listed at the Heffernan webinar website. In addition, we offer the mandatory preventing harassment training in English three times a year. With that, let's begin today's webinar, Active Shooters and Armed Assailants, Response Tools for Workplace Violence Events. Our presenter today is Dr. Steve Albrecht. Dr. Steve Albrecht is one of the country's leading experts on workplace violence. In 1994, he co-wrote Ticking Bombs, one of the first books on this subject. He has interviewed two workplace murderers in prison. Since then, he has continued to write, speak, and train on workplace violence issues, and also school, school violence prevention, and the value of threat assessment teams and safety sec and security of all employees. His background includes his work for 15 years as a police officer and reserve sergeant with San Diego Police Department. He holds a doctorate in business administration an MA in security management, a BA in English, and a BS in psychology. He is board certified in HR, security management, employee coaching, and threat management. He has written 22 books on business security and law enforcement subjects. Please allow me to welcome Dr. Steve Albrecht. Thanks, Deb, and thanks everybody for your time and attention today. I'm happy to be with you to talk about an uncomfortable subject. One good news about this issue is that in the month of April and in the month of March, we've had no workplace violence shootings in the United States, so thank God for that. We had a pretty horrible event up in Canada, but nothing in the United States. So if there's anything that can be said about the quarantine business, it is managed to contain those events, which we are having pretty regularly in this country, as you well know from looking at the news media. Thanks to my good friends, at Aspen Risk Management Group and to Kathy and to Steve and to Deb for their support and to Heffernan Insurance for their support of the program as well. In my time doing this subject, I have interviewed now three uh, workplace violence uh, perpetrators in prison. Uh, uh, one of them I'll talk about fairly recently. I did in February and then another one I just did last week. A guy named Larry Hansel. Some of you that are in the San Diego area may remember a case that he was involved in at Elgar Corporation back in, I think, about 1993, where he shot and killed the two senior executives. So I tried to be, as a practitioner, somebody who has some connection to these perpetrators, the ones that survive anyway, and I write them in prison, and then I go visit them in prison and have a conversation with them and asking the presenting issue, of course, as to why they did what they did. And of course, there's a lot of mental illness attached to that population and a lot of rage and a lot of anger towards how they were treated by the organization or the particular school in, in whatever case that may be. So if we look at 
this subject for your perspective. I don't expect you to obsess over it. I obsess over it. I'm the one that's that needs to be up nights thinking about this. I just want you to have a plan, and the plan will typically parallel your workplace violence prevention program, your policies that you have in your organization. So I'd like to start off with some poll questions. We have three poll questions. I'd just like to get a feel for what you see when it comes to the subject. So Deb, if we could roll those, please. Here we go. So our first polling question, my company or agency has a workplace violence prevention plan. This is either going to be yes, no, or don't know. And we like to make sure that everybody's uh, involved. And so um, I'm going to wait until there's about 80% of the people that have responded. So please make sure you respond so that we can get through these questions. And then We'll let Dr. Steve know what your uh, answers are so that he can understand who's in the audience and what their current level of preparedness might be. So um, we still have a few people left to vote. So if you haven't voted yet, please uh, vote yes, no, or I don't know. And all right, we'll continue. So Dr. Steve, 46% say yes. 32% say no, and 22% don't know. Okay. So we'll talk about that in a second. If you want to go on to the next one, we'll, we'll talk about the answers to all three after we've done them. Great. So our next question. My company or agency has shown some version of the Run, Hide, Fight video to employees as part of a training program or staff meeting. Yes, no, or don't know. So if you can chime in on the polling questions here. We're getting a little bit quicker response this time from everyone, so I appreciate that. Uh, we're at 36% say yes, 54% say no, and 11% say don't know. Okay. And then our last polling question is, does your company or agency have a threat assessment, emergency response, critical incident or crisis management team? Yes, no, or don't know. So this will be the last of the polling questions and then we'll get into the meat of the presentation. Okay, good. Everybody's getting good with those voting buttons just in time. Okay. Again, we have about 53% saying yes, 40% saying no, and 8% don't know. Thanks for that, Devin. Let's go back to the top question, which is a workplace violence prevention plan or workplace violence prevention policies. So we're looking to take maybe some boilerplate examples, and I know the good folks at Aspen have some examples they can provide to you of what a workplace violence prevention policy would look like. It would talk about some things related to weapons possession in the organization, but really it would deal with threats, how we get threats from taxpayers, customers, visitors, vendors, outside people, how we deal with threats that come from employee to employee or from ex-employees aimed at the organization, and a big issue that we face in this subject across the country is domestic violence crossover from home to work. Uh, the more women you have working in your environment, the more likelihood you have of domestic violence possibility. I was a domestic violence investigator for the PD in San Diego for six years. I handled 1,500 cases in that time span. As we all know, most workplace violence uh, issues involving domestic violence starts out at home and crosses over. And at least for people in California and not so many other states, and I wish it was all 50, but in California, we have something called Senate Bill 400. Senate Bill 400 says if you're a domestic violence victim, you cannot be fired for that issue. And in fact, we have to create a safety plan for you at work. In the old days, we used to fire people who brought that to our attention. Now we're trying to be supportive of that issue and say, look, this is a safety concern, a security concern for everybody in the organization. It may be embarrassing or it's, it's uh, difficult to deal with because it's emotional, but we have human resources professionals, we have security professionals, we have our lawyers, we have um, employee assistance program who may be able to provide support for domestic violence victims as well. The second question is kind of a, a variation of how many workplace violence videos have you looked at? There's probably the main one that's everybody's seen, which is the Run, Hide, Fight video, which is a, a partnership between the city of Houston, Texas and the Department of Homeland Security. That video came out right after the Aurora movie theater shooting, and it is the standard, the safety standard for videos on this subject. Run out of the building is our first and best choice, taking as many people as we can with us. We'll talk about that here today. Second, 
hideout, break room, restroom, conference room, supervisor's office, training room, someplace we can put as many people as possible and lock or barricade the door. And then third choice, fight back using whatever we have inside the building or inside the room that we can to stop the perpetrator, especially if we, we have uh, size and, and numbers difference. Um, we'll talk about sort of the perspective that people have about the fighting back part as being something that they cannot control when actually they can. But I would like to take to your uh, attention another video, which I like quite a lot, and I have shown in my training programs, my live training programs quite often since it came out. In fact, I use it as a substitute for the Run, Hide, Fight video in Houston, Texas version which is done by the California State University system. So Cal State University, and I'll put up a screenshot of the, what the video looks like, has done a very impressive animation version. It talks about the run, hide, fight criteria that the same Houston, Texas video does, but it does it in, I think, a, a more empowering way. It really, I think, resonates with students. It certainly resonates from the people I've talked to when I show it in the training programs with younger employees and more millennials and things like that. So I would turn your attention to going to YouTube putting in Cal State University system run, hide, fight video, and when you see the screenshot pop up, take a look at that one. It's about eight minutes long. I like it quite a lot. The third question comes back to something which is, I believe, the wave of the future for this issue as we go forward in our country. It is the development, the creation, the staffing, and the training of threat assessment teams. Now, in your organization, you may call them crisis management teams or threat assessment teams or critical incident response teams or something like that. Doesn't matter to me what you call it. The function is to gather together the safety and security stakeholders. That would be the senior leadership, uh, if it's just a public agency, your city manager or CEO, if it's a, a private sector firm, it's the president, the CEO of the company, uh, their, their respective uh, safety and security representatives from human resources, risk management, uh, company attorney or agency attorney. It could be law enforcement or security. Uh, if you have that function of security in your organization, it could be people from your IT department and also folks from your facilities uh, department as well to get together as a team, as a group to talk about internal threats that come from inside the organization involving current employees or external threats involving outside people taxpayers, customers, ex-employees, things like that. The function of a threat assessment critical incident crisis management team is to come up with a plan after they have gathered together and come up with a plan which is actionable and to put into place. And so we look at school violence, K through 12 schools and colleges and universities. Many states in this country have now mandated by statute that they have threat assessment teams in school districts and threat assessment teams in colleges and universities. We can take the same protocol and bring it into our, our private sector and public sector businesses. So one thing to think about for the material that I'm talking about here today, this may not be a subject which is germane right now, but I anticipate as we get back into the usual workflow with things post pandemic, we're gonna see a rise in workplace violence as we, we typically uh, do in this country for a variety of reasons ranging from domestic violence or terminations, or mentally ill employees or ex-employees who have some kind of targeting towards the business or the school if it's a student. So I'd ask you to keep my slides and print them out and put them in a file folder and have a ongoing perhaps quarterly conversation about this issue if you're in a safety and security stakeholder function and think about what you do for your employees maybe once a year. We show the workplace violence videos, either the run, hide, fight in tech, Houston, Texas version or the other one once a year just to get folks back up to speed about this issue and to tell them that we have a plan. My work in this area, as, as Deb suggested in my bio, is my workplace violence book with Michael Mantel back in 1994. I interviewed a, uh, Robert Mack, who killed two people at work at General Dynamics in San Diego. Uh, I've written books uh, um, on crisis management for the American Management Association, the Corporate Self-Defense. Uh, I wrote a book for Duke University on, on workplace violence. And also, I have kind of a interesting side um, security consulting practice, which is with libraries. And I do a lot of work in libraries around the country, and you'll be amazed, maybe you aren't, but I was, about the number of people who come in who are very problematic that come into libraries. So besides just um, predatory or aggressive people that are coming in, well, a lot of mental illness coming into the library, and those folks need some tools and skills to be uh, as safe as they can, and that's one of the functions that I do is working with libraries. So I interviewed Robert Mack, the man on the left. I just finished interviewing Scott DeCry. That's the gentleman on the right here. He killed eight people inside his ex-wife's beauty salon in October of 2011. I interviewed him in, in a prison in February, spent about three hours with him. He's a very interesting guy for a psychopath. Uh, I have a lot of perspective about why he did what he did from his viewpoint. I've also uh, talked to Larry Hansel, who killed two people at Elgar Corporation in San Diego. So 
I try to talk to these perpetrators uh, mainly because I'm really interested in what their perspective was and the other part is many of these perpetrators kill themselves or are killed by the police and they take their motives and their reasons with them. Uh, these people are pretty rare in terms of surviving these events and that's why I try to talk to them as I can. So one of my functions as a practitioner and a thought leader in this area is to really gather as much source data from these perpetrators as I can. Um, I'm empathetic to the victims and the victims' families, but I'm also trying to get as much information I, I can out of these guys, and sometimes they're pretty interested in telling their story because they're sitting in prison and has got to cry his for 450-year life term, uh, so he has a lot of time on his hands. If we look at this photograph of Southwest Airlines, uh, this is during an emergency where they had a, a, a passenger who was killed by, uh, by a piece of shrapnel that came through the window. She was sitting in the window seat near the wing and a, an engine exploded. This is the only time they've ever had a fatality on a Southwest Airlines flight. This is about, I think, four years ago. Notice that everybody's got their mask on wrong. And I think about this in sort of the pandemic world when you see people walking around with the mask not covering their nose. But everybody in this photograph has got their mask on wrong. Why they had the, the bravery to take a selfie during this, this moment escapes me. I would have been screaming as the plane hurtled down towards the ground to land. But uh, some of the folks that took a selfie here managed to uh, capture this moment and everybody's got their mask on wrong. Think about how many times people under stress go back to how they have been trained and that's one of our conversations today is how do we go back to training people, teaching people, talking to people about an uncomfortable subject like this, but to get them to do the right thing under stress. Primarily, first and foremost, is to tell us when we have something called leakage. Leakage is when a perpetrator or a potential perpetrator leaks out what he or she is going to do to a coworker or a family member, or another student, or somebody that they are connected to. And there's the weird part. They don't threaten the target, they threaten other people. And that's the interesting part about workplace violence and school violence, is the perpetrators don't oftentimes threaten the target directly, they threaten the target indirectly. Our employees have to have the courage with a capital C to be able to tell us and the safety and security stakeholders what's going on so we can address it. The second thing is under stress, how do we get people to change their behavior around the concept of run, hide, fight. How do we get them to go back to what we have talked about in the value of run, hide, fight? In life-threatening stress, we go back to what we have been told or trained or thought about. If we don't remind people about this, they may not be able to do it. One example of training under stress. Under stress, some people will dial 911 on their landline hardline phone. In some buildings that I have been to, and a surprising number of buildings, it's nine first, then get an outside line, then 911. I have seen people tell me in emergencies that they were unable to get an outside line until they remember to dial nine first because they're so conditioned as a kid growing up that it's 911. Think about your cell phone if you're calling 911 on your cell. And in many states, in my state where I am in Missouri and in California where I used to live, the Highway Patrol answers 911 calls. It could be the Sheriff's Department and for your particular county, it could be the fire department or some, some uh, dispatch which takes fire police into its main uh, lines here. But for the most part, in lots of places I go to where 911 is dialed on a cell phone, it is a state police or highway patrol answers that call. So you may say to yourself in an emergency, especially something involving workplace violence, do we have the choice between a landline or a, a cell phone? If it's safe, I would use the landline because we know that's going to ring to the right place going forward, not have that cell phone transfer over from the highway patrol. Think about how people are trained or have trained themselves to enter or exit a business the same way. I come into my office building here. There are three ways you can get into the building. I come in the same one almost every time. How would you get in or out of your facility if those doors were locked or blocked by a bad guy, an armed perpetrator, or some other situation involving the police? Sometimes, <clears throat> sorry, sometimes people do not have a sense of how to get in and out of their own building. And I've also talked to employees who were afraid in an emergency to not be able to break the window for their particular office when they're on the second floor or on the first floor. And from the first floor, certainly they could climb out. In the second floor, they may be able to jump safely to their, to their escape but they're afraid to break the window because they don't want to be charged for it. So it's things like that that I'm concerned about that we train people in under certain situations to be able to respond appropriately, especially in emergency under stress. So we think about perpetrators being armed in our facility on a higher floor. If we're on the lower floor, then we need to leave. If we're on an upper floor and the perpetrator is below us, then if we can go higher or stay where we are, that would be effective as well. And then the last part is we sort of get caught up in kind of a perspective of, of the 9-11 tragedies in, in September 11th, where 
People waited for somebody in a position of authority, a boss, a firefighter, a cop, or a security person to tell them what to do. And I tell people all the time in my training programs, if you think you need to leave, leave. If you think you need to call the cops, call the cops. If you think you need to disengage from somebody who is threatening or potentially violent, do so. Don't have to wait for permission. Don't have to wait for a boss to come by and tell you it's okay to do. About um, six months ago, I wrote a piece for Police Magazine. I still write stuff for cops, even though I have not been in the police world for a long time, but I write some things for Police Magazine on an occasional basis. And I wrote a piece that many people based on my encounters with them in training environment have told me that they believe are, are is to be true about active shooters. Number one is they think these people are invincible because they have rifles or shotguns or multiple handguns or lots of rounds or they're wearing bandoleros or they're wearing black uh, tactical vests and night vision goggles and things like this. This is not true. These people are not Navy SEALs. They are not trained commandos. They're just dipsticks that live in their parents' basement that are obsessed with guns. We can stop these people, especially if we can get away from them. We can get the police into the building as fast as possible, but they are stoppable. The second, many people don't realize that the perpetrator has about five to 10 minutes to carry out his or her act. It's rare to see women do this, occasionally do, but mostly men, and they have five to 10 minutes to kill the people that are on their quote target list. And they have a target list, which is typically somebody who has bullied them, especially in a school violence situation or in a workplace situation, somebody who has broken their heart or has fired them or has taken credit for their great ideas, et cetera. They have a, a rationale and a revenge perspective for this. The five to 10 minutes piece is they know the police are going to arrive in force and they're going to use active shooter training protocols. I've trained lots of cops in this country on this issue. Every police agency and sheriff's agency in the planet in the United States knows these protocols and that they're going to engage with this bad guy as soon as possible. He has five to 10 minutes to do what he does before he commits suicide or is killed or arrested by the police. Third, many people believe that once the police get on scene, it'll be obvious to the police as to who the bad guy is because he'll be holding a gun. Now, we know from these perpetrators that they sometimes blend in with the crowd. They have tried to escape and sometimes they will um, hide their guns and try to look like another employee or another student. So it is up to us <clears throat> sorry, to train our employees to be as vocal as possible on 911 calls about what this person is wearing, what they're doing, what, what direction they're going, and the full description of this person. Four, many people don't realize that this perpetrator has a target list, which ranges from bosses, HR people, um, security officers, or their former girlfriend or former wife, or, you know, I have seen in these, in my cases, her new boyfriend or her, her new husband. Uh, so sometimes that's a concern because these people will be the ones that this person specifically looks for and they may need extra protection. That's why I'm always a big fan of physical security devices that are different for the CEO's office or the city manager's office or the human resources director's office where people shouldn't just be able to stroll in and see these folks just walking off the street. They need better security. Fifth, a lot of people mistakenly believe that playing possum, laying on the floor, and hoping this person won't shoot them is a way to survive the event. I disagree completely. And I guess it comes from my cop background and, and what I have sort of trained my mind to do in terms of fighting back. But I would believe that if I can't run out of the building first and take as many people as I can with me, and if I can't hide out in a barricaded room, that I'm going to fight back. This person's not gonna, not gonna kill me at work. So I believe that we have all kinds of resources, including chairs and fire extinguishers and a pot of hot coffee to stop these perpetrators. And the best we can do in these situations is to fight back because that's not what they're expecting. Six, um, some people do not believe that this perpetrator would fire through wooden doors or tinted glass. We have seen them do that. Uh, the door is not a good place to hide directly behind. I see a lot of glass when I go to organizations and I look at supervisors' offices and things like that. The best thing we want to get behind is something that is solid, not masonry walls and things like that, but brick or stone or concrete if we can, stairwells, places where there's less likelihood this person can shoot through and hit people. Seven, there is a perspective here that the police will be able to provide first aid or paramedics will be able to come in and provide first aid. My experience in these events is that is not true because the police spend most of the time looking for the perpetrator and clearing the building. By the time they bring in the paramedics, and the firefighters, um, many people have bled to death. So we, the employees, will have to be the ones that provide first aid. This includes moving people out to uh, areas where we can put them in a rolling office chair or put them in a blanket and carry them out or carry them out in teams of two and three and get them out to safety. So one of the things that we are seeing now, or at least in my perspective, 
Um, and when I do site security assessments for our clients, we put tourniquets into our AED machines. We put tourniquets into the first aid kits. There was a really cool program out there called stopthebleed.org and bleedingcontrol.org or stopthebleed.org is a collection of nurses and doctors around the country who provide one hour tourniquet training for uh, employees is kind of a brown bag lunch. It's actually kind of fun for a sort of ghoulish subject. I went through it in Colorado when we were living there and I liked it a lot. I think it's very useful. I like tourniquets. Eight, many people are still sort of stuck on the idea that workplace violence is about, about gunshots, is not actually gunshots, it must be firecrackers or a car backfiring. And this is not true. If you've not heard what gunshots sound like, take yourself out to an outdoor range somewhere and sit in your car for 15 minutes and just listen to that sound and take it in and memorize what that sound sounds like. Some people are still sort of stuck on the idea that it must be firecrackers in May. Nine, Many people not, may not realize that the police are going to show up in mass in a, just a wide ragtag variety of uniforms. We may have tan uniforms and may have tan pants and or tan shirts and green pants. We have blue uniforms. We have state police who wear black. We have all kinds of uniforms, border patrol in green, customs in blue. It'll be detectives with suits and ties on. It'll be undercover guys with goatees and ball caps. The issue is that the police response will be swift. If you remember the workplace violence incident in San Bernardino about uh, six years ago in Christmas time, um, there 300 people came, 300 cops came to that incident. So we will see a plethora of cops, a, a range of cops wearing all kinds of gear, all kinds of different uniforms. The employees must know that's what the police look like and follow their instructions because under stress, sometimes they don't see the cops as cops. They may be wearing SWAT gear or camouflage or black and people see them as not being cops, but sometimes as, as being the perpetrators because they're carrying weapons and are dressed in dark clothing. So we must train ourselves to remember this is what the cops look like. Number 10, I'm a big fan of PTSD counseling. I like employee assistance programs for these uh, employees who have been involved in these situations, either from a primary or a secondary or tertiary exposure to the incident. I like the idea that we provide critical care for the mental health resources for people and that they come back to work at their own speed and whenever their normal comes back to their lives. And the last one, this is sort of an afterthought, but it amazes me that in all the years that I have been doing this, in the 28 years that I've been involved in this subject, we've not thought about this beforehand, which is to train employees to give key cards to the first responders. If you have a facility that has key card access to the hallways, to the elevators, to various rooms where we have maybe more expensive uh, equipment or assets stored, or we have you know, senior leadership where there's a different set of key cards, we need to give those to the first responders, specifically the police, the paramedics, and the firefighters so they can get in and provide services to the folks they come across who may be hiding or waiting in those rooms. National Institute of Justice did a study about seven months ago, eight months ago in August, that they looked at mass shootings in this country, and they came up with four criteria, which are no surprises to you or me. These perpetrators had early childhood traumas, specifically exposure to violence, sexual assault, child abuse. Um, there was some sort of crisis event in their life that they could not cope with, getting fired, breaking up with somebody, um, the idea that their family has, has collapsed around them. They looked at other attackers. We saw a lot of examples where these perpetrators had kind of a hero worship perspective of some of these attackers. And they learned a lot about this stuff on social media and mass media. And the last one that they had access to guns uh, to achieve their plan, especially for school shooters who got their guns at home. When we look at the prevention outcomes from the NIJ study, it's, it's probably no surprise to you any of these things here as well. Better physical security, better personnel security especially in schools, malls, churches, public places where folks gather. Second, better access uh, restrictions to guns, especially by the mentally ill. Third, um, social media controls that we prevent this idea of sort of narcisside, which is I'm going to commit suicide in kind of a narcissistic way after I've killed all these folks because I want to be thought about it and I want to be infamous and I want to be, be horribly remembered in my community no matter what. So what we see is a movement towards not covering these perpetrators by name and face. And I think in the shooting that happened in Canada about a month and a half ago, I don't think they covered the perpetrator by name and face. When we were living in Colorado, uh, the, a cop was shot and killed in a, in a carjack situation where he rolled up on an Uber lady that was being carjacked by a guy. The perpetrator shot the officer in the head um, and uh, um, seriously uh, wounded him where he's in a vegetative state. I don't think he's died, but he's in a vegetative state. 
They arrested him that night. They did not cover him by name or face for six months until the trial. And so this is something I think the news media has some control over, not covering these perpetrators by name and face and contributing to this idea that they want to be infamous and well-known in a horrible way for what they have done. There's also this discussion we just had about leakage, awareness of leakage, the idea that, that employees can tell their bosses or boss's boss or HR or security or risk management or the company attorney or agency attorney about what they have heard when they hear this type of leakage about somebody wanting to harm folks. And then the last one, which is probably the toughest of all the recommendations is how do we improve the mental health resources in this country? If we think about how difficult it is to provide mental health resources to folks experiencing homelessness, if we think about how difficult it is to provide mental health resources to people now that are feeling anxiety and depression over the pandemic, it's really a challenge to think about how we will provide better mental health resources to people who are suicidal or homicidal. Uh, it tends not to get the kind of coverage and funding that it needs to be able to help those folks. <clears throat> Sorry, seasonal allergies. So these perpetrators are not in a hostage situation. They're not there to talk to the police about a helicopter and a, and a $50,000. It's not a negotiated situation. They're there to kill people. We need to use the run, hide, fight protocol. We have five to 10 minutes to get out of the building or to get into a barricaded place before the police arrive. One of the reasons we want to move out of uh, the perpetrator's ways to avoid him, certainly, but avoid police the police response. We want to stay out of the way of the cops. One of the ways we want to get into a barricade situation in a room that we can lock or barricade is to get out of the way of the perpetrator and certainly the police when they do their part. Lots of different uniforms. Remind our employees, remind our staff to be ready for that. First aid training would be useful for everybody, but really tourniquets in our first aid kit. Most people can figure out how to put on a tourniquet. If you use the stopthebleed.org the or, or bleedingcontrol.org as your uh, training resource, you'll be well ahead of the game. We want to have our staff give as much information to the uh, dispatchers so that the arriving firefighters, cops, and paramedics can figure out what to do, especially the police response for wh where this perpetrator is and what he has done, what kind of weapons he's carrying, et cetera. These are not Navy SEALs, these perpetrators. These are not Marine commandos gone rogue. They're just dipsticks with guns. We can stop these people, we can fight back, and we can win, and we have seen it happen in this country. So how do we manage our staff concerns and fears about this? I think you take incidents that happen in the country, in the United States, and you use them as sort of a teaching tool. You say, what can we learn about this? What perspective do we have about this particular incident or event that we can do differently were it to happen around here? What does this do for us in terms of our physical security or how we treat our HR applicants, how we treat terminated employees, et cetera? Uh, do we have anybody in our population who may be disabled as an employee or a vendor or a contractor or a customer, a taxpayer, a client? Uh, are they children uh, that have uh, mobility issues, little kids? Who do we serve in our organization as a public or private sector agency? Do we have anybody with special needs, uh, developmentally disabled uh, people that may need support to get out of the building or to get to a safe place and be able to lock down? That's certainly a concern when I think about my library clients. They have a wide variety of people coming in, ranging from, from little kids to the elderly, and they may have mobility issues, and that's a conversation as to how we protect and save those folks in this type of rare but, but devastating incident. Now, we discussed the possibility of the police response being very um, different in terms of the colors of uniforms and types of cops who are showing up. Uh, we could have lots of cops on the situation in these mutual aid events. Have we talked to the staff about what that would look like so that they remember that they have to follow the police instructions? In my perfect world, and I don't live in the perfect world, but if I did, we would have a run high drill once a year. We do a 15 minute drill every year, just like we do for tornadoes or hurricanes or fires or anything else we do a one year drill for earthquakes, things like that, where we would say to all employees, okay, on this date at eight o'clock in the morning, we're gonna have two choices. You can leave the building for 15 minutes. So go out smartly, get out quickly. Don't fall down and break your ankle, but get out of the building quickly for 15 minutes. Come back, go back to work. Or go to the safest place in this building, lock it down, and stay there for 15 minutes. If I'm the consultant doing the drill and I walk through and I can't see you inside or outside, then you've done the drill successfully. Again, for the safe room concept to work, it has to be a place that they can barricade the door, or at least lock the door as necessary. It doesn't have glass. It's not in a situation where the, they can be seen. They can shut off the lights. They can spread out inside and stay there until the police arrive. In my perfect world, we do that drill once a year just to remind folks this is how we do it. Under stress, you go back to how you have been trained. 
The sad reality is if you have kids in K through 12 environment, especially K through six, they've probably done a lockdown um, uh, drill in for their campus probably once or twice uh, a year. And sometimes they do it every time the cops come driving by chasing after somebody, they lock down the whole school. So your kids sometimes know this better than we do. Mental health resources going forward for these uh, employees that have been exposed uh, to workplace violence, uh, not necessarily at a fatal level, but when we think about threats and things that are happening where people are afraid to come to work, do we have an employee assistance program? Have we made access to our employee assistance program so that people know how to get to it? It's not a secret that they believe that it is confidential, which it is, and that they know how to get those resources on their own. So we looked through some statistics here. It's fairly grim. Uh, four of the biggest mass shootings in the last 50 years happened in 2018. You can see the Stoneman Douglas High School, Borderline Bar and Grill in uh, Thousand Oaks. Uh, I was there the next day after that happened. Tree of Life Synagogue in, in um, uh, Pittsburgh, Santa Fe High School um, in Texas. And then you see, of course, the Las Vegas event. But you look at these uh, other events that have happened recently, El Paso, Texas, Dayton, Ohio, uh, Virginia Beach, uh, Virginia last year. You look at the events in the, down at the bottom, and you can see that we have gone through a span of time where that we have not had workplace or school shootings. And this is really a, an evolving type of a situation. When I got started in 92, this, this situation was strictly connected to the post office. And now the idea of going postal, we have not seen a postal shooting in about 17 years, but now we're seeing it at schools and churches and malls and synagogues and public spaces and theaters. And it's really evolved since where it was from zero in the early 2000s to where it is now, where we have, you know, uh, f um, uh, f 15 of these uh, in two months or one a week or, or 35 in a year, depending on what statistics you look at. So if you look at these perpetrators from mostly where they go at, there's a lot connected to the right-hand side of the screen, which is commerce. So the biggest workplace violence threat, and this is something the news media doesn't pay attention to, is robbery. The biggest chance of being injured or killed at work is if you're doing a retail job where you're in jeopardy being robbed or as a tax, taxi cab or a cab driver. Left-hand side of the screen tends to be education or school environment, and then we see all the other things that happen as well. But So the biggest workplace violence perpetrators tend to be robbers, and that's something that the news media doesn't typically cover. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> if we look at OSHA statistics here, uh, for the, about a seven, six, seven year span of time here, seven deaths, uh, seven years of deaths, 2,173 at that time, about 300 people a year. So that suggests that about one every couple of days, somebody's murdered at work. Most of those happen in robberies. We can see that in, in um, uh, category one, but also strangers. People just come into the, to a, an office or a facility or somewhere. Um, we had a workplace violence shooting where I uh, am in Missouri here. About a month ago, a, a police officer was killed. Another was injured. A guy went into a, a convenience store here. He killed uh, three people plus, plus the cop and then uh, killed himself. So I don't know why these things happen in this way. If we look at category two, it's people who have a connected relationship to the business. And the biggest risk factors for there are typically students and patients. Healthcare is a very dangerous environment, especially emergency rooms and schools, of course, K through 12 and colleges and universities. Category three is a smaller um, um, perspective here in terms of the overall, uh, category two is smaller than category three, but it's current or former employees. That's the one the news media typically thinks is the most prevalent. And then the last one I think is a shadow issue is domestic violence involving a, an employee or an ex-employee who comes back to the facility and harms one of our folks in a domestic violence relationship or situation. These are all difficult to manage, but I think the most difficult ones to manage is category one in the stranger perspective, no connection whatsoever to the organization. In category four or three, we may have some warning signs about their, their potential behavior, which we can address. Category one, the stranger's piece, not so much. I belong to a group called ATAP, the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals. This is our pathway to workplace violence, school violence or, or workplace violence. You can see it starts with a grievance. It moves through a violent ideation. And then at that point, the perpetrator or potential perpetrator makes a decision to go all the way forward to the attack. Oftentimes they're driven away by good security, by empathic treatment, by managers and supervisors, especially an employment situation or a, a discipline or termination. I'm a big believer in treating everybody with empathy and dignity, especially in discipline or termination situations, angry taxpayers, angry customers, that type of thing. We can really go a long way towards minimizing the possibility of this based on how we treat people. A lot of their drivers for this issue is based on revenge. So everybody's had a violent ideation. It usually lasts for about four seconds, and then you go back to your cup of coffee. 
in these perpetrators, the violent ideation can last for months or even years. And they carry these things around, and we discover them typically in their writings, their postings, their, their Facebook, their diaries, journals, things like that. So this is a, a, a kind of a typical path we'd see for these perpetrators. We overlay this in our workplace violence and school violence prevention work. It's typically what we have seen over the last 25 years. <clears throat> so the question I get all the time, either on news media interviews or from folks that are concerned like you and I, especially in the workplace, is why do these people do these things? And the really issue there is they have something called the broken bridge of self-esteem. The broken bridge of self-esteem says, I don't care about my own life, literally, and I don't care about anybody else's life as well. There, we see typically early psychopathy in this population. I get to use my, my psychology degree here. <clears throat> psychopathy is typically diagnosed in people 18 forward. We see younger uh, um, clients, customers, or um, uh, patients with early psychopathy here. There's a narcissistic entitlement, meaning I want to want to be famous for all the wrong reasons. Oftentimes they're suicidally depressed, in which case they're a danger to themselves and others, but they really have no regard for other people. This broken bridge of self-esteem says I can hurt other people and not feel bad about it. I can kill myself and not feel bad about it. And so that's where we get all the Ds, dangerous, disaffected, depressed, driven to act, revenge, this desire for revenge, and desperate and dangerous. So <clears throat> here is a collection of behaviors that I look at in the workplace, and I don't see these as labels or profiles. Again, we're very careful here. We're not profiling people. I'm focusing on behavior. Do I see an employee who is troubled or one who is troubling? Do I see an employee who has anger issues or which is anger turned inward, which is depression? Do we see any kind of religious zealotry or connection to terror groups? Are they perceived as other people would see them as an injustice collector? Their favorite phrase is, it's not fair. People are trying to screw me or ruin my life. Um, do we see any sense of a substance abuse, uh, especially stimulant drugs or alcohol? Uh, who would you rather live next door to, one meth tweaker or 100 pot smokers? If we look at them being bullied uh, is a significant risk factor. Off the job issues with no support, that's typically divorce, um, financial problems, marital problems, uh, problems with their children where they feel like their life is over or, or their, their support systems are broken down. Again, owning a firearm is not a risk factor. Um, being obsessed with firearms to the point there are other people are concerned or acquiring one for the purpose of revenge that sometimes they leak out information is a big concern for us if we hear those things. <clears throat> Probably the biggest risk factor for me up there besides a justice collector is that they talk about workplace violence or school violence events or incidents as if it were a good thing. Yeah, that guy in Vegas who shot all those people at that concert, that was, that was pretty cool. That guy frightens me. That's not a normal empathic human response. These people need to be addressed with their concerns and behaviors because sometimes they say, well, I was just kidding or I was just joking around. I have fired lots of people for making jokes, quote unquote, about going postal or harming people in the workplace because they have been warned not to talk that way and they continue to do it. The last couple of parts, do we see the more howler behavior, which is attention drawing, or more hunter behavior, which is working in stealth, trying to prepare to harm people? Howlers howl. They don't typically harm people. Hunters hunt. They don't typically howl. They don't leak information out to the target. They leak information out to third parties. Do we see third party threats as part of this concern? So quickly here, we'll look at um, the, the uh, screenshot for the run, hide, fight video, which is done by the city of Houston, Texas, and the Department of Homeland Security. It's fine. Um, I think it's about six and a half minutes long. If you want to skip the guy that looks like Vin Diesel with the shotgun, uh, just drag the cursor about 90 seconds forward and you'll skip the shotgun part. It's not bloody, but sometimes it makes people uncomfortable. Um, my favorite choice is this Cal State University video. I like it a lot. Again, it's a cartoon. Um, it's very empowering, I believe, for employees, especially younger ones. I think you could show it to your kids, say 14 or 15 years and above at your house and feel fine about the subject. They, they know about it anyway. But I like this video quite a lot, and I always suggest to folks that this is the one that they show maybe once a year as a training video. So we think about the run, hide, fight piece. Um, can we do the 15-minute drill once a year of the run, hide part? And then the last part on the slide here, if you see this idea of cover versus concealment, cover stops bullets. This is a brick wall, concrete, bollards out in front, steel, um, uh, uh, staircases that are made out of concrete, et cetera. Concealment hides you. So concealment is blinds, drapes, curtains, tinted glass, tinted windows, masonry walls, wooden doors. A steel door that stops bullets would be cover. A wooden door that does not would be concealment. We typically want to get people behind as best as we can cover. Uh, that's not always possible in the work location, but some places are better than others. When we think about the concept of the active shooter safe room, think about this as important. 
we do not designate a safe room for all employees. We don't say the break room is our designated safe room. We say to employees, go to any place, restroom, conference room, supervisor's office, storage room, someplace we keep the mops or the file folders where you can be with as many people as possible and lock the door. We don't designate safe rooms for the obvious reason that sometimes a perpetrator could be a current or former employee. We don't designate safe rooms because they may be um, um, being used by some other function or some other thing where they're not possible for a safe room at that moment. So that's why we don't designate them. So think about, here are some college students in UCLA during an active shooter situation. They took some cable and tied up the door, um, closer up at the top uh, and barricaded the door. <clears throat> this is either an art exhibit or a pretty good example of an active attacker in Ohio State University where the kids put all these chairs up against the door. Again, the bad guy is not going to push through this collection of material here to get inside the, the door. If he comes up to the door and can't get inside, can't see inside, the door is barricaded, can't get inside using physical force, he will move on. Why? Because they only have five to 10 minutes before the police arrive and they know that. They wanna be able to do what they have prepared to do. If we are behind barricaded doors, if we have a barricade situation set up like this, that is our best chance of survival. So again, the issue I get all the time when I talk to people about active shooter situations, especially if they have been a, a, a witness or involved in an in a active shooter situation, I get the same two things, which is uh, firecrackers and I can't believe this is happening. Uh, both of these are big barges floating down that river in Egypt known as denial. Again, it's not firecrackers, especially in May in the office, and it is not useful to say I can't believe this is happening. What you say is, this is horrible, I need to get to the safest place possible, this is a room I can get to and barricade, or if that's not possible, I need to get out. My first choice would be to leave the building, taking as many people as possible with me. And one of the questions that comes up all the time in the, in the uh, run, hide, fight discussion is, do we let people inside our room if the perpetrator is outside and they were trying to get into our safe room? That's a really tough question. The answer is we wanna save as many people as possible. We wanna do this in a way that doesn't reveal our hiding place and let the perpetrator into our safe room do the best you can. I'm not saying to leave people out in the hallway, but I'm saying it's important that everybody does the same thing at the same time so we don't have that horrible decision to make, get everybody behind a safe place. So as we wrap up, kind of an overview of some of the things that we talk about. We wanna remind folks about this in new employee orientation. We don't want make people afraid to come to work or stay at work or do their work. We don't wanna scare new employees from working here. We just wanna remind you that in the rare possibility this happens, we have a protocol which includes the concept of run, hide, fight. We want people to think about what they would do for themselves first and think about what they would do for their coworkers second and then everybody else, vendors, customers, et cetera, third. When I look at this concept um, um, in the middle piece there and fire alarm response, one of the things that concerns me is some employees may inadvertently pull the fire alarm because they think it's a good idea. I'm not a fan of pulling the fire alarm. I think it moves people out into harm's way. I think it sends a mixed message to people in a safe room where they feel like they have to leave to come out and see if there is an actual fire. So you can do what you want, but from my perspective, and I've talked to my partner, Bob May, who's a fire chief, and we agree that if you do not see smoke and flames in a real active shooter situation, but you hear the fire alarm, you should stay put until you know otherwise. I'm not leaving a safe place to go out into danger unless I see smoke and flames. It's very unusual for us to have building fires in the modern era. So I tell people, do not pull the fire alarm unless it's an actual fire. Do not pull the fire alarm as a way to drive people out to safety. The perpetrators have done this, the Stoneman Douglas High School case in Florida, the perpetrator did that, which was unusual because they had a fire drill actually scheduled that morning like at 8 or 8.30 in the morning, and then he came at around 2 o'clock in the afternoon and pulled the fire alarm again, and people were surprised. It is not useful to listen to a fire alarm as a response to workplace violence actual situation. When you think about the police response, again, they will be aggressive towards stopping the attacker. They will not be very useful in providing first aid until later. That's why we have to do the best we can to provide first aid to our coworkers or employees. And really, I think about some concept that came from a famous trainer in California named Gordon Graham. And Gordon Graham used to say, the lifeguards cannot drown. If you're a lifeguard, the first person you have to save is yourself. You cannot drown if you're a lifeguard. Your first and foremost function in a workplace violence situation, rare as it may be, the rare possibility that this happens, you have to take care of yourself first, your coworker second, and everybody else third. I get it sometimes we say, what about the little kids or what about the elderly or the disabled? I get all that. Got to take care of yourself first, your coworker second, and your 
customers, taxpayers, visitors, et cetera, a third. The reason for that is you are no good to anybody else if you're not safe. You have people that want to see you that you want to go home to. You need to take care of yourself first, coworker second, everybody else third. The safe room concept, again, is well in, ingrained into the law enforcement response. We've seen no cases where the perpetrator has, has uh, shot through the door to come inside. We've seen them shoot into glass to get inside the school, as happened in, in the San Diego Elementary. But we've seen no situations where the perpetrator has knocked on the door and attempted to impersonate the police. They, they have not done that. Now, it doesn't mean they won't, but we've not seen it. We look at the situation and say, fighting back, especially as a group, we have pots of coffee or fire extinguishers or books or chairs or desks, we can stop these attackers. A, they're not expecting resistance. They're expecting people to give up. B, they believe that because they are armed with a handgun or a rifle or a shotgun that they can overwhelm an entire room. And C, they think that they're invincible. We know those things aren't true and we can stop them if we use force against them. We don't assign workplace violence safe rooms. We also don't do something which I think is sort of a holdover from the safety and security side of things back to the idea of fire drills, which is staging areas. Uh, we've seen this in bomb threats and in, and in fires and fire drills where employees go to a staging area. Everybody meet outside by the flagpole. Everybody meet over here in the parking lot next to the dumpster. I'm against this idea of staging areas in workplace violence situations for obvious reasons. I don't want the perpetrator to go there and be able to harm people in a staging area. And also, in the run part of run, hide, fight, if you can get into your car and drive away with as many people as possible, you can stuff into your car, do that. If you can get as far, far away from the building, keep this in mind. Some of these perpetrators may be armed with rifles and things uh, shotguns where the ballistic capability of those weapons could be up to a quarter mile. We don't want to be anywhere near the building for obvious reasons of the perpetrator. We don't want to be anywhere near their building to interfere or get in the way of the police response. And again, we want to make sure that we have given our key cards, our access control cards to the cops as they respond to the building. We saw this happen in Virginia, where in the Virginia Beach shooting last year, where the cops came in and could not get into various hallways because they were trapped by the key card readers. Give your key cards to the cops. Again, cover stops bullets, concealment hides you. We want both, but cover would be our first choice. Left-hand side of the screen, a good safe room, lockable door, windowless, no access, uh, not, not five ways to get in, but only one way in, one way out. It's off the main hallway. There is a hard line, landline phone installed. Uh, to be able to call out for police help. Second side, right-hand side, not so good. Close to the hallway, unlockable door, um, sometimes a no door at all, just an entryway into a room. In a perfect world, you wouldn't be in there. In an imperfect world, the best thing you may be able to do is get down on the floor, cut the lights, be prepared to fight back if the perpetrator makes his way inside there. In the left-hand side, we would have things inside like flashlights and fire extinguishers and first aid kits. Uh, right-hand side, again, not so much. So. I always think about where's the best place to hide in my office environment that may not be a perfect thing like a, a, a file room or a place where we store the mops, but it may be the safest place to be. So think about utility closets, think about restrooms, think about storage areas where we can go and we can put as many people as possible into that place and barricade and lock down the door. In terms of my clients, the toughest place to secure is a hospital. Hospitals don't have a lot of locked doors up on the floors. I mean, outside of PEDS and ICU and, and emergency room, oftentimes the access control is fairly easy. And we're seeing hospitals move away from this idea. And, but typically, you cannot lock hospital or treatment rooms. And, so, and also, we don't teach run, hide, fight in hospitals because healthcare people won't leave their patients. We teach a different approach there, which is to protect them and to protect themselves. So when you think about the safe room concept, think about in your facility the best place to put people where you would go. So let's talk about a couple things before we wrap up. One is that these events are catastrophic for, for sure and rare, thankfully. And despite what the news media says, there are not homicidal maniacs everywhere. Oftentimes we stop these situations before they turn to violence based on how we treat the people involved. Ex-employee or soon to be ex-employee, current employee facing discipline or termination, uh, disgruntled taxpayer, customer, visitor, vendor. We, we address their issues, we do it with empathy. We're assertive for our own rights as an organization, but we're we're careful in how we treat people so that we don't embarrass or humiliate them. We don't create this sense of revenge. Most of these perpetrators are lone wolf males. 
They typically use guns or, or edge weapons. We see a lot of swords and, and knives in, in places like China and Japan, or we've seen a lot, especially in Europe, of using vehicles to run over folks and to harm people. But most of the time in these situations, it's one person. I've, I've, we've only had about five cases in the United States where there have been more than one perpetrator. Um, uh, Oklahoma City, we just had the uh, anniversary for uh, a couple days ago. Um, um, the marathon, Boston Marathon bombers and Columbine certainly come to mind. Most of the time, these are lone wolf perpetrators. So it doesn't mean there's not more than one perpetrator, but typically it's one person. That's usually what the police are looking for. Again, no shooter has ever pretended to be the police or, or shot through doors to come inside. That doesn't say it won't happen, but you can say that oftentimes the question I get is, how will we know the police are there? You'll know. You'll hear their radios. You'll hear the jingling of their equipment. You'll know. Certainly, we cannot predict violence. I get this question all the time, especially in the, old, the early days of workplace violence. Can we predict what people are, not, are going to do? And the answer is no, but we can look for behavioral warning signs, not, lab, not labels or profiles, but behavioral warning signs that a reasonable person, not a psychologist or a lawyer or a cop, but a reasonable person would be concerned enough to talk to coworkers or bosses or bosses' bosses or members of the safety and security stakeholders for the organization. And the last one, most important, is we can pay attention and listen to employee leakage or student leakage, which is they tell people, not the target, they tell people around them what they're going to do. Sometimes they can't help it. Sometimes they want to be talked out of it. Sometimes they are testing to see what people's responses are going to be. Sometimes their mental illness is so severe that they cannot help what they say. But this leakage is what helps us stop these cases. Our greatest strengths are when we are vigilant as a management and employee team that we have measured responses. We don't overreact, we don't underreact. We think about what we're going to do and we talk about it in partnership with our safety and security stakeholders. HR, IT, facilities, security if that's a function, law enforcement, senior management, the company attorneys or agency attorneys all have, along with human resources, all have a part to play in their specific expertise about these issues. So watch the run, hide, fight video. Uh, I like the Cal State University system version. Make sure employees see it at least once a year. Know that employees may need to be reminded to dial 911 nine, instead of just 911. Remind employees to trust their intuition, not to stage outside, to train themselves to get good descriptions of these perpetrators should this ever happen. Think about our clinical resources, including employee assistance program or local psychological services. If you have contact with law enforcement as a public agency, you can get their perspective about this issue and make me happy in my perfect world, schedule a 15 minute drill where we do the run and the hide once a year. So I always like to wrap up a difficult subject like workplace violence with pictures of my dogs. Deb, back over to you for questions. Wow, Steve, that's a lot of dogs. <laughs> I, have, I have a lot of dogs. <laughs> great, well, you did a great job today. We had, um, a few people that had audio difficulties. So I will remind you that we did record the session and if you missed um, any of the session because of your audio dis difficulties, we'll be sending instructions for how to access the recording as well as the other webinar materials. Uh, so look in your email for that information. And I'm really sorry about the handful of people that had the audio difficulties. It's hard to tell what it is when most people um, are not experiencing the audio difficulties, but we do apologize for that. Um, we didn't have any other follow-up questions from the audience, so I'll go ahead and thank everyone for attending today's webinar presented by Heffernan. We will send information by email with instructions on how to access a copy of the presentation on our website. And thank you, Dr. Steve Albrecht, for your time and experience today. We hope Thanks to Evan. Thanks to Heffernan and, and Aspen. Um, and we do have one question that just came in. If we have, since we have a little bit of time, are you aware of any public agencies that have mandated armed assailant response training drills that we can model in the state of California? I do not know that, and I, I think that most forward-thinking organizations have at least a discussion about doing a drill. I've not seen a lot of drills outside of schools. Um, you may try K through 12 schools, school districts, or colleges and universities as a resource there. Look to the to the uh, school resource officers on the K through 12, or look to the college or university police, because there are mandates for those folks uh, around the country to do drills and to have threat assessment teams. They may be able to model for your agency. Okay, and there's a question, is there a different protocol for small pharmacies? I'm, a, I'm imagining that has to do with uh, drug-related thefts and things like that. 
Yeah, that's a big issue in terms of the robbery piece for pharmacies. I, I have a lot of concerns about pharmacies, uh, especially when they don't have um, um, shatterproof glass in front and, and things like that, where these perpetrators come in and rob them for uh, opiate drugs typically. So I, there's a lot of protocols to follow about about uh, keeping the pharmacy staff safe and, and having good responses to uh, robbery prevention. I'm, I'm a fan, especially if that's a concern of putting up glass. Okay, and w what is your recommendation for big open spaces and where to go, such as a stadium? A stadium. Yeah, that's really um, a, a concern. We're we're looking at lots of ways to improve things. Um, you know, post Las Vegas incident, we look at you know things that in the Super Bowl and and the Oscars and lots of big events where we're trying to figure out how to move lots of people. I always try to say to folks, you know, try to stay out of the middle part of the crowd, stay on the edges, and figure out how you need to get out if you had to in an emergency. Most people don't think about that when they're trying to enjoy the the show or the or the ball game. Right, and um, in a fifteen minute run hide fight drill do you let people find their own places to hide yes I, I think if you can get out of the building get out if that's your choice great if you want to hide out in any place you want to go to that's great um, we, you've done the drill successfully as, a, as an employee staff if we walk through we can't find you okay and a question this will be our last question then we'll sign off here is there anything um, a, any recommendations about employees carrying concealed weapons this is a big controversy in our country. There's uh, a lot of policies that prevent that from happening. Some organizations allow employees to have firearms in their cars. Uh, my biggest concern is it, it, it's really a difficult response for the police because they don't know who is who in terms of good guy, bad guy. I think it's an evolving discussion, but so far you know, my, my protocol is to say let the police uh, be the ones that respond with guns. All right. Well, we hope all of the attendees found today's webinar to be a valuable use of your time, and be sure to join us on June 2nd for our webinar titled HR and Payroll Re Record Retention. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Steve, and have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Take care.